discovery prospects for this and why this is kind of an interesting way of looking for dark matter. Um, but to, to, to wind back and go all the way to the beginning, um, I'm going to assume that we're happy that dark matter exists. This is, at this point, this is a conservative assumption. And the usual story is that if you have something like a dark matter talking to the standard model through some heavy mediator or, or something like the WIMP paradigm, so the, the Neutralino and the MSSM, uh, then there's a story from, you can even, it's like the first page of the snow mass proceedings on dark matter, where you have this complementarity, right? You have these interactions that are blobs and pairs of dark matter particles and try to pairs of standard model particles in different ways you can constrain. It's pairwise because of usually gauge invariance on the standard model side or some parity on the dark matter side. And the, the idea is once you know what this blob is, then you have many different ways of constraining it. And, and this story, uh, in its simplest form, is, is starting to become very constrained. If we, if we edge away from this kind of very minimal and simple thing, uh, uh, one very modest change is to assume that the thing connecting the dark sector and the standard model is a mediator. And that this mediator, the dynamics of this mediator, may be important. In particular, when the mediator is light, then dark matter can annihilate directly into this mediator. Now, I've thrown in two more couplings, so, so you've made the model a little bit more complicated. You have a lot more wiggle room. And one thing that you observe is that this is very trivial, and almost stupidly trivial way of saying, well, here's a model where the coupling of the mediator to the standard model can be very small. And processes like direct detection, where dark matter scat scatters off ordinary matter, or LHC production, where ordinary matter produces this mediator, um, can be very small. So sorry, these dots are different. I should have swapped the colors. Um, but you can make these parametrically small by just assuming that this connection is, is small. But we still get this WIMP miracle if we have an order one coupling here where the relic abundance of dark matter is still set by thermal freeze out. So thermal freeze out is this really nice idea that, that the amount of dark matter that we see is coming from this balance between expansion of the universe and dark matter annihilation. So okay, here I, I have just made my theory a little bit more complicated and, and now I have a way to, to avoid the, these stringent constraints and, and tell a nice story. So what? It sounds like I think this, this is just arbitrary. Now it turns out if I constrain myself though to renormalizability, to renormalizable portals, it's actually not so arbitrary. There are basically three classes of renormalizable portals within this framework. Either you're going through the Higgs, uh, so something like a Higgs squared, phi squared interaction. You're going through the right-hand neutrino, the neutrino portal, so this is like a, a neutrino Yukawa. Or, what we'll focus on in this talk is kinetic mixing. Uh, and this is the idea that maybe the dark sector isn't so boring. Maybe the dark sector has its own gauge dynamics, like some, some U1, and this U1 um, can mix with a standard model of photon, a really standard model of hypercharge. So, so this we'll, we'll get into. Um, but it turns out you really have, uh, there, there are many ways of doing each of these games, but you really are constrained to, to a small subset of different ways of connecting uh, the dark sector to the standard model through a like mediator. What, is there any particular reason why uh, renormalizable portals are motivated in this context? Ah. I mean, higher dimension operators would be fine also. Absolutely. So this, this, is, a, this is a slice of, of theory space that I consider. Okay. All right, so, so I gave you the story that, that um, you can still have annihilation with these mediators. I, can, I, can, I have this dial to turn off other modes of, of detection. So maybe we should be looking for the annihilation of dark matter. So you know, every morning, Jonathan Fang wakes up, comes to the office, and reminds us that indirect detection is three things. Right? It is a place where dark matter can find itself and annihilate. It is a final state to which those particles annihilate. And it's some experiment that you're using to detect these final states to look for dark matter. And what I'd like to present today is a story where dark matter collects in the Earth and annihilates in the core of the Earth into these light mediators, these dark photons, and it can be detected by the ice cube detector, this one kilometer little cube of, of ice in the Antarctic. And towards the end, I'll tell you a bit about the sun and AMS. So this general framework is not new. The idea that dark matter can capture in celestial bodies is, as, is older than the grad students in this room. Um, and dark photons, this idea of dark photons being a connector to a hidden sector, is also older than most of the grad students in this room. 
Um, and in fact, during the heyday of Pamela, uh, these, these two ideas came together very nicely. Um, there are, however, new things under the sun, and, and this is what we'll get into very briefly. Okay, so this, this is the game. What are these dark photons? So it's, the idea is it's a very simple, you know, it's a simplified model, so I can, I can write down the Lagrangian in half a page, and I've, I've color-coded this. So you have some new dark U1, there's a kinetic term. Um, it's spontaneously broken, so I, I, I have a mass for this mediator. I'm going to be completely agnostic about what gave that mass. Maybe it's a dark Higgs, maybe it's some Schuckelberg mechanism. All that matters is the dynamics of what gives this mass. It's not playing a, a role in the story. Uh, you have dark matter, chi, sometimes I'll call it x, I think, which is charged under this, this U1. A nice choice for what this coupling ought to be, so let this collapse on parameter space, is the coupling for which you have the correct relic abundance. So, so I can say for a given dark matter mass, I have a given coupling such that the whole WIMP, the thermal free dot story carries through. And the most important part is this kinetic mixing term. Right, so this is f mu nu, f mu nu prime. Right, this, is, this is a gauge invariant operator uh, that connects um, the dark photon to the photon. Now, what you see, so this is, this is almost like neutrino oscillations, but it's not a mixing through a mass term. Um, and you can tell, so this is now a kinetic term, which is not diagonal, so we should do our due diligence and diagonalize it. Yes. YGV, is it? Uh... Oh, sorry, yes, yes. So, good. Um, so the the I did it right, you know. um, uh, yes. So this this will be an output of the analysis. So okay. so the the proposed search will be sensitive to dark photons around the GV. Right. Thank you. So we have to diagonalize this, and this is actually fairly straightforward. Uh, what you end up with are, are are these interactions. So the dark photon talks to dark matter, the dark matter current, as expected. The photon still talks to the electric current, as expected. But you pick up an epsilon coupling of the dark photon, the massive state, to the electric current. So now the dark photon can decay into, say, E plus E minus. What you do not get is a coupling of the dark of the ordinary photon to the dark current. Right? Dark matter stays dark. So this is why this is this is a very nice, a nice uh, mediator. So this this happens automatically because you have a you have a U1, U1 electromagnetism is unbroken. Now you should argue all the grad students here should be up in arms saying, okay, this is, that's a cute story, but electromagnetism is not a fundamental symmetry. If, if you really can only talk to two U1s, then you really have to make a hypercharge. So here's what happens. So this quadrant remains the same. Um, the Z still talks to the neutral current as expected. Um, the electroweak coupling, so the photon does not couple to the neutral current, it just talks to the electric current. The Z doesn't talk to the electric, so this is preserved. Um, two new things happen. You have, you have a coupling of the dark current to the Z, suppressed by epsilon. So it's the same, the same order as, as, as this guy. Um, one thing that, that you can think about, and I've actually been thinking about this, where would you ever see this? Right, so if you're looking for free projects, there's a free project. Uh, and, and the simplest place to look for would be at the LHC, do, doing these monojet searches. Right? You look for a hard jet and then something going to dark matter. The problem is, these things have cuts of hundreds of GeV, and if you have a cut of, say, 400 GeV, an off-shell Z looks just like an off-shell dark photon. So I, 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 that's, that's a curiosity. Can I ask a question? Yes. So um, if, you, uh, if you, you know, if you're just in the thermal history of the universe, this mm -hmm. means that you're always producing some A's, probably out of equal, A prime, sorry. Mm -hmm. You're always producing some dark photons from the standard model of that. Yes. And so you're, there's some temperature, minimum temperature, uh, as long as the weak interactions are in equilibrium, you're always yeah. going to have some minimum temperature of those sides. Yeah. Have you looked at that? I, so I think, yeah, so I think you're saying that, you, so, so these, these A primes will be unstable. So I, I think, correct no, me if I'm wrong. the other way around. I think it the other way around. Ah. So I'm saying, as long, so let's say your A prime is, you're saying it's a GeV, right? Yeah. So as long as there are particles heavier than one GeV around, yeah they're going to be producing the A's at some rate. That's probably not enough to keep the A's in equilibrium because epsilon is small, right. but still at some rate. So this is kind of like this freezing dark matter mechanism. Yeah, yeah. And so I'm just saying you can compute that relic abundance and or the temperature of that to see if it makes any difference. 
I, I, yeah. So this is, yeah, that we have not done. I suspect for a GEV it would be okay, but for lighter A's there might actually be some A primes. Mm -hmm. Lighter A primes, I, I suspect there might be some constraints or signals. And yeah, there, there are games you can play with this. So, so for very small epsilons, you can imagine that the two sectors never started out in thermal equilibrium. Maybe the infotonic refers one sector to the other. Um, some, a lot of these early models for, for dark photons use that to get the correct relic abundance. But for, for the most part, that yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not going in that direction. Um, oh, the last point. In addition to, to this, this curious coupling, you have this other curious coupling. The dark photon is not really just a, copy, a heavy copy of QED. It talks to the neutral current. It's, it's suppressed, so it's suppressed by the dark photon mass squared divided by the Z mass squared. So the, on top of epsilon, it's really suppressed. But this is something, in some optimistic future, if you, if you, if you discover something in direct detection, this is, some, this is one possible way of looking for a cross-check. I don't know what experiment, um, but it's a very small coupling, but it's parity violating, right? This thing has P less than P rise in it, and on top of that, the dark photon automatically, by gauge invariance, must couple to neutrinos. So that's, this is a curiosity. Okay, so that, that's, with, with that, I think you guys know everything there is to know about the theory of dark photons. Further questions? Um, so the dark photons, are, are they're, they're well loved and they're well explored. So just, just looking at the idea of having a, a massive U1 that has an epsilon mixing with a photon, uh, you have all sorts of really fun bounds. And most of my plots in, in this talk will be on this axis. You have a dark photon mass, uh, and on the y-axis, this kinetic mixing. And you can see, so, so up here there are bounds from, from uh, B factories, meson decays, you know, G minus twos of leptons, this swath are mainly beam dump experiments, where you, you smash a proton or electron beam onto a target, maybe produce some dark photons that propagate throughout the lead dump, and you just instrument the back of the dump and see if anything comes out. Down here are bounds from supernova cooling. These were actually recently updated by, by Reddy et al., um, taking into account the resumations of ladder diagrams. So this, this actually shrunk a bit. Um, this is a funny bound coming from supernova blowaway. So taking supernova 1987A, um, if dark photons were in this mass range and in this coupling range, they would have been produced in the early stages of supernova, and they would have decayed at the crust of the progenitor star. And doing this would have broken apart the star and given you a visible signal of light before the neutrino signal which was observed. So that, that sets a curious bound. And then these, these colored regions are the cosmological bounds from nuclear synthesis and distortions of the CMB uh, by our friends up in Victoria. So this is all just to say that this is a, a, a parameter space that many different types of experiments have been probing to, to explore. The, the proposed search that, that we're talking about in this talk makes use of this part of our half-page Lagrangian. The fact that you also have dark matter of a certain mass range um, coupling to the dark photon. And just as a preview, what I will have are reach plots. So these are numbers of, of events expected from, from Ice Cube that will be situated on this map. And the region of sensitivity will depend on the mass of dark matter. Right? So, so our story will be, if dark matter annihilates in the center of the Earth, you produce dark photons, and the boost of the dark photons, how, how boosted they are to get out of the Earth, depends on the mass of dark matter. So this, these regions will shift as, as I vary the mass of the dark matter. Okay, <coughs> so that now you are all dark photon experts. We'll, we'll get to the main story. So, so for that example, you are, sorry, I couldn't tell. Yeah. Can you just go back, so for the... So this example here, uh, there is, you are already, this, this yeah, the, the, diagonal line is already, what is that? That's right, that yeah. wasn't there before. Yeah, so, sorry, exactly. can you just explain what, yes. is that, uh, what is that line? So, so what was here before was purely uh, bounds on a dark photon, saying nothing about dark matter. Right. Now I say I'm in the dark photon paradigm, and I have dark matter of a certain mass. Now I am sensitive to direct detection experiments because I, I have all the information. Direct detection, and you're extending it by that little yeah. nose. Yeah. So, so what I'm saying is, yeah, exactly. So once I say I have dark matter, I have our story, but also you have to put into account other balance from once you know what the dark matter mass is. Okay. So let's jump into this story. The first step is dark matter gets caught in the Earth. 
And in fact, this is the thing which, which is, is really simple. I mean, here, here is a statement. Dark matter is caught in the gravitational potential of the Earth. If it scatters against some nucleus in the Earth, we have lots of nuclei in the Earth, uh, such that the outgoing dark matter has a velocity which is less than the escape velocity. Classical mechanics 101. So it's an elastic scatter. It looks just like this. And you look at this a bit, and you remember, you know, Amelia is here, and you say, ah, OK. This is, this is just direct detection. This is direct detection on a planetary scale. And that's what's really nice about that is that I know how to calculate things in direct detection. And so I can actually calculate the rate at which this process happens. And, and I just take the equations from direct detection. And, and the rate at which I capture dark matter is proportional to how much dark matter there is locally. There's some volume integral over the number density of targets in the Earth. So here I is like iron. Iron is a good, a good representative. Um, you integrate over the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution, F. Here is the, the warping of the distribution coming from the fact that as dark matter approaches the Earth, it accelerates. And then here is just an integral over the cross-section uh, given the recoil energy. And the only tweak that you really have to put in is a theta function where you restrict this integral to regions of parameter space where you actually capture and you, you remove regions where, where the dark matter is just going too fast and exits the Earth. So all this is just to say that this is, this is something which we can calculate and we can calculate fairly easily. Then there is this, this very simple, almost trivially simple differential equation to write down. The amount of dark matter that's captured in the Earth is n. The rate of change of n is the rate at which you're capturing dark matter minus the rate at which dark matter annihilates. And here there's an n squared because two dark matter particles have to find each other to annihilate. Okay, you can solve this differential equation and there's a characteristic time. It's the geometric mean of the, the inverses of these two rates. And what this, this time, this, this equilibrium time has a special meaning. If the age of the Earth is larger than, than this equilibrium time, then the Earth is saturated. Every time you collect two dark matter particles, two dark matter particles find each other and annihilate. You've reached your limit of how much dark matter is in the Earth. If the age of the Earth were less than this time, then you're not yet saturated. You can collect two, four, ten, a hundred dark matter particles, but you still don't have enough captured dark matter to find each other to annihilate. So a criteria for which this story is, is meaningful, a criteria for which we have maximal annihilation, is that the age of the Earth is larger than this equilibrium time. So here's, here's where the new part comes in. Until fairly recently, actually, um, the common lore was that the Earth is never, ever, ever in equilibrium. So the capture rate is, is fairly large. We have, we have the whole volume of the Earth. But the annihilation rate was just too darn small. And it's, it's fairly simple to see that. You, you, you take your favorite neutralino in the MSSM and you say, oh, actually, this annihilation cross-section, even though I have this, this capture rate, they just don't annihilate enough. We're just never in equilibrium. And so that, that was the bummer. But now, we're, you know, by, by hook or by crook, we're, we're in, this, in this era where we're thinking about light mediators, and something changes. And this is what changes. Now that you have a light mediator, you mediate a long-range force. So, so dark matter collects, um, it, it bumps into other nuclei, thermalizes, cools off, and ends up in, in a little ball in the center of the Earth. And the center of the Earth is around 5,000, 6,000 Kelvin. So this is actually fairly, this is fairly cold. So I, if, if you guys hear these talks about self-interacting dark matter, they talk about how, oh, dwarf galaxies are very cold. These, these long-range forces are very important. Well, the core of the Earth is way colder than any dwarf galaxy. And what happens when you have non-relativistic scattering is, is something called Sommerfeld enhancement. Now, Sommerfeld enhancement is, is simply the statement that if you want to shoot the moon, I mean, literally hit the moon, you would rather hit the moon with a slow bowling ball than with a laser pointer. Right? The laser pointer sees the geometric cross-section of the moon, and the slow bowling ball, once it escapes the Earth's velocity, will be pulled into the moon by its gravitational force, by its long-range force. In the same way, very cold dark matter at the core of the Earth, with a long-range force, will feel an additional attraction, such that the annihilation rate is actually larger than the Born approximation. Right? If, if two things are being pulled together, yeah, they're going to interact a lot more. 
So, so the punchline is actually that, that, that yes, this, this is enough to do it, but you can kind of think about, okay, what's, can we, can we diagnose this? Okay, so, so going back eight years ago to the heyday of Summer Felton, Hansen, and Camilla, um, we would write down expressions like this. So this, this is some approximation for this resummation of ladder diagrams, this, this long range force pulling, distorting the plane waves. And in fact, you could just look at this, the numerator, and that, that was a good approximation. And this approximation is really taking the limit where it's a Coulomb interaction. It's a really light mediator. Something funny happens when the mass of the mediator is not negligible. And, and okay, this, this is actually something which we know. Uh, the Coulomb potential turns into a Yukawa potential. Okay, so how is the Yukawa potential different from a Coulomb potential? There's an exponential. There's a scale. So this is no longer scale invariant. And you, you write, so when, when you rederive this, this long range force, the Sommerfeld enhancement, you get this complete mess of an equation. And you look at it and you're like, oh, geez, why, how did you go from something so nice and simple to something really messy? Like, why are there hyperbolic cosines? Why, why, why do you have trig functions? <clears throat> and it turns out, what, what this all is telling you is that once you've introduced a scale, scale in your problem, this Yukawa potential is almost like a really shallow well. And this, this potential can support shallow bound states. So all this is telling you is that in your system, you can expect to see resonances. So just to diagnose our statement that Sommerfeld enhancement is important, we can then calculate what the equilibrium time is. And lo and behold, here are these beautiful resonances confirming that the Sommerfeld enhancement is a thing which is important. So here are two plots. Again, the usual mass of a dark photon kinetic mixing plane for two different dark matter masses. And the green region are the regions for which the age of the Earth is longer than the equilibrium time, i.e. the Earth is saturated with dark matter. This is a thing which you would not have for ordinary neutralinos. This is what you would not have without the long range force. So that's, that's why this is, this is timely to, to think about. Okay, so then, now, now that we're happy with that, it's actually downhill. You take this, this equation, here's the solution, if, if you guys haven't solved in the back of your papers by now. This tanch is really just telling you that uh, for a large age of the Earth, sorry, this would be Earth, um, this thing is one. If it's smaller than the, than the equilibrium time, uh, this thing is closer to zero. And now we just, it, so, if you guys want to hear some propaganda, here's some propaganda. We're really looking at this rate. We are looking at the rate at which dark matter annihilates. And uh, say for those of you who are following this, this Fermi GeV excess, you know one of the favorite things people love to argue about are J factors. Oh, what's this, what's the density of dark matter? And, you know, how what's it likely two dark matter particles find each other? I have just told you you can look for this rate, and you never have to calculate a J factor. In fact, if I were to lie to you, I would say, look, there's no astrophysical uncertainty. But in fact, the, the point is the astrophysical uncertainty is the local dark matter density linearly for capture and not the likelihood of two dark matter particles to find each other in the center of the galaxy where the distribution is unknown. So this, this is really probing this process in, in a different way. So now it's easy. Now we know the rate at which we're producing dark photons. And, and the pitch is really nice. We, we are now, there, there are dark photons coming from the center of the Earth. And the, the way to discriminate to look for these guys is to just look downwards. Look for dark photons that are upward going in the radial direction. And you can ask, well, okay, but they're in some, they're in some ball in the center of the Earth from some thermal distribution. Well, how big is this ball? Well, for typical wimpy scale dark matter, um, from, from my height, it, it's a solid angle of about a penny on the floor. Right? So it's really straight up and down. So we can go ahead and calculate this rate. So the number of signal events is equal to the annihilation rate. This two here is because you produce dark photons times the ratio of solid angles. So, so it's the effective area of ice cubes for one kilometer. But that's divided by the surface area of the Earth. Um, times the probability. So here's the probability that you decay in ice cube, not before ice cube, but not after ice cube. That's what this difference is telling you. And then times this running time, which we take to be 10 years. And you're looking, so I should, I'll just mention to you that ice, the, the signals in ice cube um, if you produce a muon, muons are minimum ionizing in ice, and you really see just the straight line. Like muons are, are beautiful. You just look at, at this chunk of ice, and there's a straight line put in the center of the Earth. 
Um, electrons and quarks are a little bit messier. There are things you can do with them. It turns out you actually have a directionality up to, to 30 degrees. Um, but let's, let's ignore them for this talk. And the reach, here we now go back to this plot. So here's the, again, mass of the dark photon over kinetic mixing. Our favorite map. I am plotting to here the number of signal events in ice cube. And this goes from one to a thousand. So what I really mean by a thousand is this data, if this data is probably already ruled out. Like this, this region is probably already ruled out. And all that you need is dedicated analysis uh, for, this, for this search. As I, well, let me, you can see from, from the shape, actually the shape of the contour is curious. You can see that there are wiggles down here. So this is, this, this lower limit is being shaped by the equilibrium time. For kinetic mixing, epsilon, smaller than this, your dark matter is not in equilibrium. The upper contour is set by the decay length, meaning if your epsilon is too big, you're, being, you're, you're decaying before you reach ice cube. And, and the, real, the, the easy way to see this is this really big dip here. Anyone know what this dip is? Around 1 GeV. So this is, this is the Rho meson. This is when, when you're tickling the Rho meson resonance and your decay length takes a dip. So, so when you say it's probably ruled out, that's because uh, you, don't see, you don't see muons. You don't expect muons like this from uh, upward going muons. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Energies. You don't get however many, 10 a year or something like e that. Yeah, even though they haven't done dedicated search, they would have noticed a whole bunch of muons coming from the pointing to something. This is at the level of whatever, 20 a year. But so it's crucial for the signal that it actually happens inside the ice cube. So you cannot yeah. wait to see the muons coming Absolutely. from in bed or yeah. it has to be you have to see the the, the Oh yeah, so it's this, not it's just a, an upward going. No, it's a question. Yeah. It's not an upward going. You really want to see the the, the key? I mean what 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 is the signal? What would at, at this level we're just looking at one so it's it's collimated muons, but we're assuming it's one muon, one track. So I'll, I'll say a bit about oh, okay. resolving the two tracks. This this is one track. This is, this is it's appearing. The point is, is that you're requiring right. it to happen inside ice cube. Yeah. In a, yeah. So it looks, even though if you can't distinguish the two ah. muons, yeah. it's you're seeing it appear inside ice cube. So That's it's right. a neutral going to muons. Right. Yeah. Because so otherwise, I guess you don't have any way of getting in the standard. And, and and just muons by themselves would be there's too much background. Is that the point? So just imagine to, to measure the flux of muons. Well, what do you mean? Is too much background? Oh, just just count just, muons. I mean, yeah. yeah it's, 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 well, I mean, you have an additional handle, which is you know that they're all coming from. from no, that's right. So I'm wondering because this is assuming that the decay is inside ice cube. Yeah. Uh, what if it decays before? I mean, we then some. you have a whole bunch of muons from from the atmosphere. Well, that's, that's right. I see. So you can there's a division with the directionality if you cut on the directionality. But you have a twofold, but so you cannot tell. If they, I mean, how's that? Well, well, we'll oh. say a bit more about this. Oh. Yeah. Um, but the other, from the, the, the flip side of that is that, um, let's say you do have an upward going muon, are you really sure you're going to be, like in a particle detector, you know, you have discrete hits, and so you might not see it for a while. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if you, if you, is that a serious background? Uh, well, really the, the muons are, the, the ice acts as your detector. Yeah. So it, it's hitting the, the, the ice and the water molecules. So it's just constantly emitting light. I mean, there's no danger of a muon not emitting light for a while. I just don't know how it's Yeah, no, it, I, yeah, it's, it's, it, it's like the ice was made for, for looking for new ones. And so, so even though your, your, your instrumentation for ice is, is fairly coarse, um, you could, it's, the mu ones are the cleanest signal. So there's basically zero chance that it's not emitting light for a meter or two or something. That the mu one goes dark for a meter. Yeah. I think not. Okay. Um, you, you can also buy yourself a kilometer or two because these muons are really penetrating, so you, the muon could be produced like two kilometers below ice cube and, and it would still reach ice cube. They, they don't lose very much energy in the ice. But, okay, so... Oh, is that, is that the, sorry, I still want to understand the same, the same I thing. think that answers my question. Yeah, so that's the so point. So there's a fine right? range. The point is, is that if they were created, if they were created on the other side of Europe, they would have made it. just never made it, yeah. But oh, I see. Sorry, I missed the question. Really question. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I see. But then you should be then it should be the attenuation length, not the ice cube size. That is 
Assuming that that's bigger yeah. than the ice cube. Unless size. it's yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Unless so it's comparable or smaller. <laughs> I might have. Yeah, yeah. What was, maybe what he's saying is that it's comparable. Sorry. So here's here's the the relevant uh, propagation of. We're going 2.5 kilometers, so it is a border of the ice. It is a border. Exactly. Yeah. So, so the, yeah, okay. that's the answer to the question. All right, that's yeah. it. Thanks. That answers the question. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's the first time I've ever had the pleasure of using that first time. <laughs> I'm geeking out here, so I'm going to start. Thank you. Um, okay, so, so, so this is for 10 TeV. Um, just to, to emphasize the point, if I go from 10 to 1 TeV, I expect this to go down. Right, so because now one TeV dark matter gives you less boost, so you need to have a smaller epsilon to propagate to the surface. Um, you might ask why the direct detection curve didn't move. That's because the white nucleon cross section scales the same way as the annihilation rate. Um, and just to keep going, let me go all the way down to 100 GeV. So this is motivating why why we took this range. If I set 100 GeV, oh, okay, that seems to be right around the limit. And if I, if I want to forget the, the wind miracle, I can imagine pushing to a maximum coupling um, set by, say, uh, positron bounds, and, and maybe you can push this far. Um, if, if an ice cube experimentalist were here, they'd just shake their head, because at 100 GeV, you no longer have the, the, the energy resolution um, in ice cube. 100 GeV is when, when your, your, your muons and your electrons start getting too soft. So what you really want is a denser, de more densely instrumented subvolume, which you have. It's called deep core, and but it's smaller. It's, it's like a tenth of the volume. And once you, once you you specialize deep core, then the volume hits you too much, and, you, and you're really not probing your space. So that's 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 the story of why uh, this is sensitive down to around 100 GeV, but not much further. So I kind of mm -hmm. just don't remember how ice cube works. When they see neutrinos, they see very high energy neutrinos. Yeah. So those things must be converting by some. Yeah. It, it's it's yeah. So it's. So it's, don't those create muons inside ice cubes? That's, that's right. That's my question. That's right. So they create some muons, and they've seen those guys. Mm -hmm. So that sets some. Is that a background? Is that a is that an irreducible background? If you want, well, well, but these muons yeah. will not be. You have the directionality. That's that's yeah. That's the point. So you can kill them. Um, okay. Good. So, the one time I'll show you a plot that's not on the same axis. Here is here is an example. Just just to present the reach in a different language. Here it is on the WIMP nucleon cross section. So this is the direct detection plane. The mass of the dark matter for a given dark photon mass. Here is the the cross section. These are now outdated lux bounds, but the colors correspond to one, ten, a hundred events. And what's this? Okay, of course I picked the plot which is most provocative, but for a given uh, dark photon mass, you can really probe a region that, that's actually beyond the, the old lux bounds, and even probing into the neutrino field, so assuming that you are within this dark photon scenario. Okay, so in fact that's. So this is so this is the, the vertical axis is the. The, the nucleon cross section. So, what does that translate to for epsilon? Oh, let's so see. Where is this on? I mean, is this is this in the, is this the same region? Is this anywhere near the same region on the other plot, or is this some other completely different region? Yeah. So, so the conversion it, it's the same as the other plot. So, so you would take so for the hundred MeV. Where where would that? Fine. Uh, let's let's take. Where is that region on this? Yeah, let's take one TeV. So for one TeV dark matter and one GeV dark photon, that's a nice, a nice region. That corresponds to between 10 to the minus 8 and 10 to the minus 9 for epsilon. Um, so it's exactly in the same region as these Earth things? Okay, so this is one GeV dark photon with one TeV dark matter. And so that corresponds to that around 10 to the minus 46 for the one nuclear cross section. But don't, isn't epsilon another parameter? I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Yes. Yeah, so, so, so um, I'm just saying yeah. you assume. I, I, I thought that this cross section is essentially mainly controlled by epsilon, right? Because it's, That's right. And so I was wondering what values of epsilon 
the you have for 10 to the minus 36. So, so this is around 10 to the minus, so for this mass, this yeah. corresponds to 10 to the minus 8-ish. So now can go, sorry, can yeah. go back to the other one? So yeah. 10 to the minus 8 is where? It's right around where you are. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's sorry, the these plots are the same. Sorry. Oh, same. Oh, yeah, sorry. I'm sorry, it's the same information. This is direct? Oh. Yeah, I'm sorry. It's, it's, oh, what? I'm sorry. Yeah, I this, thought this you were saying this, the other one was direct. Detection. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, you're it's, just comparing it's the same, inf you're just mapping it onto a different number. Yeah. I'm sorry. No, 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 it's, it was point. my fault. Okay. Okay, so, okay, so in fact, that, that is one package story. Um, let, me, let me now be very optimistic, and, and you can see why my optimism may or may not be justified. So let's ignore the shallows. For now, we've been saying that there's a hierarchy in the dark matter and the dark photon mass. So these dark photons are very boosted, and when they decay into these light muons, these muons are very collimated. So you see one track. Of course, we know another candle that we have is that you actually have two tracks. What would it take to actually see these two tracks? And then this is really a smoking gun. You see two tracks that are nearly parallel, pointing to the center of the Earth. That's got to be some light particle uh, being produced at the core of the Earth. And so you can, you can ask about this. And so here are some, some distributions. I'm already making optimistic assumptions. One thing you can look for is a time delay. So if, if here's the center of the Earth and I'm a dark photon and I'm propagating along, I can decay into mu plus mu minus this way. And then this muon will reach the detector before this muon. And so that gives a time delay for, that's typically, so here's some distribution, typically 0.1 nanoseconds. And so that sounds like a very small number to me. So maybe that's, that's not a great, great number. The other thing you can look for is track separation. So you know, I'm a dark photon, so I the Earth, I decay. And you would think that the biggest track separation you get is when you decay perpendicularly to, to the direction of motion. Um, but you'll see there's this funny kink over here. This actually comes, this is just a nice exercise in relativistic kinematics. Turns out when you, when, when you have this hierarchy of masses, you get the biggest opening angle when you decay nearly parallel and anti-parallel. Because this guy goes straight, and this guy's moving really slowly and there's a lot of time to propagate in the transverse direction. So that's why you have this funny kink here. But the characteristic, anyway, the characteristic opening angle, well, it gives you, well, over the course of one kilometer in ice, the characteristic track separation is 10 meters once you reach the surface. 10 meters sounds like a, that's, that's a big distance. I can see 10 meters. Well, and this, this is probably the, the picture that you wanted to see much earlier. Here's Ice Cube. You have a whole bunch of strings of an instrumentation, and uh, these guys all have these optical modules. You can see these terrain called light. Um, the strings are 100 meters apart. So, oh, geez, 100 meters. 10 meters is nothing compared to that. Um, conversely, though, this 0.1 nanoseconds is still too small, but it's actually not that small. The, the resolution of these, the timing resolution is 5 nanoseconds, which is actually, it's remarkable for, for, for this experiment. Um, so, so this is just out of reach, but there's actually there's some hope to, to actually improve this by combining the two. So, for example, one thing that that, that they do not do in their analysis, and they don't really have an analysis for this, is if you have some ice cube string, and here are, here are your optical modules, and if you see two muons, one thing you can do is look at the timing difference for the Cherenkov light from this muon versus the Cherenkov light from this muon. And you may even have just enough resolution to, to use that. So you're using space and time information to distinguish parallel tracks. So th this is this is a, a curious uh, way forward. Can I ask a question? So, so um, um, it sounded like you were saying that if you if that you don't you don't your, your worry is not that you have standard model background. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you you know so you might say well why would I worry about this on a first pass I just want to first of all detect something that's not in standard model but I could worry that because of this separation that the standard search for muons just isn't going to work because this track has enough they it looks enough not like a single muon that it won't find the track so I'm wondering is it even do you are you you know do you know whether do you, do you know whether or not you will actually have good efficiency for finding these things, if, even if you don't try to do anything fancy, just because of this? It's not exactly like a single view. Oh, I see. So, so, yeah, I see a concern. Um, you might. 
this might be too much of an LHC point of view where you're, you're really putting cuts because you have tons of data. Um, here, I, mean, the, I, I think the threshold for a track is, is pretty low. And so a fat track is a track. There's certainly no trigger in there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yes. Okay. okay. Um, let me. There's some guy sitting there, and then something comes on. His yeah, screen. it might as well be a grad student, like looking at look, and they're very pretty pictures. <laughs> um, but yeah, this this is not a high rate experiment. Um, this is I, this, this is astrophysical opportunities, uh, which is a a euphemism for astrophysical uncertainties. So one thing that we didn't talk about was the gravitational pull of the sun. Why wasn't the sun just accelerating dark matter past the Earth? Um, and you know, 15, 25 years ago, um, the state of the art was that numerical simulations said that the gravitational potential of Jupiter and Venus um, in the solar system actually compensated for this largely. Um, more recent simulations by Annika Peter and friends um, cast this into some doubt. So there's room to improve the estimates uh, using uh, taking uh, into account the planets. I totally don't understand the question. Right? Oh. Why aren't I worried? Why am I just as worried about the Earth being pulled into the sun? I mean, the dark matter is orbiting with the Earth, so. What's the so uh, yeah, so so we had this statement that that as dark matter approaches the Earth, it, it's accelerated by the gravitational potential of the Earth, yeah. and then the elastic scattering is now pulled to be a little bit more energetic, so it's less likely that that it will be stuck in the gravitational potential. And if this dark matter is hitting the Earth, and maybe it's just on the threshold of being captured. But the additional acceleration from the sun is pulling it. That's a tiny effect. It's right? I mean, it's a tiny, I mean, we're, we're near the Earth. The sun's the, 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 the tidal forces of the sun are like nothing. Anyway, okay. uh, the other thing to, to think about are whether you have these so dark disk, not double dark disk, not 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 the self-interacting thing, but the the halo of dark matter is basically spherically symmetric. But there are numerical simulations saying that there are substructures, like little small fractions of dark matter that clump together, that can be slowly moving and can fall into our galactic plane. And if so, or you can have these stellar streams when the galaxy is merged and you have this, this stream of dark matter that's, that's slow moving. In this case, you can have a subpopulation of dark matter that's very slow relative to the solar system. And those would be more amenable to capture. So here, the, the, it's another piece of So we estimated this, and it turns out to be a, a pretty small effect. Sorry, so for, were you, for the sun, were you, were you saying that the, the dark matter is being sucked into the whole solar system by the sun? Or you're actually, you're actually worried about losing it? Because yeah. Because the sun is going to suck it out of this, the Yeah, so, so this, is, this is the statement that um, yeah. where the solar system is kind of traversing the wind, wind and it's, it's, it's going through the, the wind halo. Um, and if the sun can kind of... Uh, it's just it's the acceleration of the dark matter as it passes through. I, I, if I think about the wind, wind hitting the Earth, rather than sitting, this thing being stationary sitting in a halo. Because every, every, sorry, everything here has to do with the fact that we are in motion relative to the dark matter. Yes. And so whether the sun is accelerating the dark matter... Oh, so the sun may be affecting the, 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 the kinematics of the dark matter. Yeah, the velocity distribution. Okay, so so um, in the last ten minutes, let me let me just tell a very quick story, because um, now it seems like I've given you the framework, and you can just go down the list of targets. If you can do it in the Earth, you can do it in the Moon, you can do it in the Sun, you can do it in Jupiter. Why not just? Even if they're all the same size. <laughs> so this, these two, this is even accurate, right? <laughs> More than one percent. Um, so, in fact, the common lore, going back to 10 years ago, is that the sun is a great place to look for this. The sun is gigantic, lots of targets, huge gravitational field. There must be tons of dark matter in the sun. And that's true. The, the sun is always in equilibrium to good approximation. And people would, would, would people even wrote papers on, on this exact scenario for dark matter capturing the sun. And, and the story is, in fact, really, really great. You just say, hey, we have this, this experiment, AMS which is actually looking for dark matter. It's looking for positrons coming from dark matter. And little known fact, AMS has amazing angular resolution, like less than 1%. So you can really look in the center of the sun. And you just tell you just tell Sam Tang, like, look, take your experiment, forget about this Pamela excess, just look at the sun, the thing you should never do, your kids should never do, but you look at the sun with AMS, 
and you look for the overdensity of dark matter in the sun relative to the non-overdensity in the background. This, this is a bump hunt for indirect detection. The thing which, which people missed five years ago or six years ago is that if you're looking for positrons from the sun, well, the sun also has a beast in it. And, and if you're really looking for this directional signal from the sun, those positrons are going to be deflected by the B field. And the B field is, is large. Um, and it's also changing in time. So there, there are ways to do this analysis, but we wanted to see so how bad is it taking into account the B field. So we took a simple model. This is this Parker spiral model. Um, note that the sun is not a dipole. Um, and we asked the question, what would it take to, to do the same search for the sun using AMS? And you basically have two choices. One is, um, what solid angle around the sun am I, am I looking at? So that's, that's one choice. And I can fix that by saying I only want to take one background event, some, some arbitrary choice. Then given this, this solid angle, what is my minimum energy cut for positrons that I'm willing to accept so to, to maximize my signal? And you can now map out signal space. So here's the positron energy, and here's the distance from wh at which the dark photon decays. So inside the sun, you don't produce anything because it gets stuck in the sun. Or you can decay past the Earth. This coloring is roughly the, the probability of decaying there. So we want to do down here. And the choice of angular size and minimum energy corresponds to a curve which cuts out this region of signal space. And as I change E cut, this curve moves up and down. So, so there's an optimization to do. So we, we, we went ahead and you can do this semi-analytically. Um, sorry, I'm not, I'm oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. I'm not, it's okay, but I, I, I just didn't understand. You're saying that, that if you, you were saying if you, if you look at different radii mm -hmm. and these things here, you're getting different amounts of signal and background. That's right. And you're, you're just you're optimizing that. Yeah. Okay. And the background is just coming from cosmic rays that are just flying past the sun. That's right. Okay. And in fact, that you can just read off of the, the AMS data. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I'll make a quick note that I am I just I do not care about the Earth's magnetic field. It'll complicate things, but but I think what a fair statement is is that this is a B field which is known and it's something which is compensated by AMS. So, so AMS will do the ray tracing. And here are the, here are the sobering results. And first, I just wanted to say that the, the, the curves look similar, but they're shaped by different physics. So here, the red is a probability of detection. This is this whole rigmarole by picking a size and picking an energy cut. So this is an efficiency. The black contours correspond to dark photon production in the sun. So your reach is black times red gives you this green curve. And you can see that the, it, it's fairly modest. Um, and here it is uh, in, in better resolution. So really, we're, we're looking at this red curve for one signal event, and that's really barely poking out of, out of supernova cooling bounds. And this, this is, it's a fairly sobering result. We can understand why it's so sobering. So let's, because this is simulation, let's let's turn off the magnetic field of the sun, and you're actually now poking out quite a bit more. The other thing which is hitting you is that AMS is on the International Space Station, so which is orbiting Earth, and is pointing radially outward all the time. So a good portion of the time, we're not even looking at the sun. So if we turn back on the B field of the sun, but now assume that you could just only point at, this, at the sun where you have maximum exposure, you're also reaching out a little bit more, more in this case. So these, these are the two effects which are really hitting you hard when you look at the sun for, for dark matter. Um, here is the ice cube direct detection plot that you saw earlier. And just for comparison, this is, the sun is much more modest. So this is the inversion of the common lore. Um, and, here again are the imaginary scenarios. If you had no B field, you're actually poking out a bit. Um, and if you had high exposure, meaning you didn't have to follow the ISS, um, you have a different region of, of sensitivity. So the so, so sun is not as, as nice as people thought a few years ago. Let me just quickly comment on, on the moon. So 
Um, there is a, a Mexican politician in the late 1800s, uh, Perfio Diaz, who has this famous quote about Mexico. You know, Poor Mexico, so far from God, yet so close to the United States. And this is the problem that the moon has. The moon is smaller than the Earth, it has less matter, less gravitational field, and it's also closer to the Earth, and you might worry about the effect of the Earth's distortion with the velocity distribution. One thing that we're playing with that may or may not work out is if, if you have inelastic dark matter, maybe you can use the inelasticity to help trap dark matter in, in, in the moon. Um, a pitch is that once you have a massive dark photon, you already have the order parameter to give you an inelastic dark matter species. Um, but this, this is tightly constrained. The other thing which is kind of fun to think about, this is just at the level of, of fun, fun things to think about, um, I'm really obsessed with this idea of really seeing these two parallel tracks, these two muon tracks. And we saw that Ice Cube maybe if it might be able to do it, what, but what would it really take is a detector with really high resolution in both time and space that can look for charged particles. And we have that. It's just currently being used for more important things. So the CMS tracker is actually the ideal a detector for this. And in about 2022, I think, they're going to actually replace this and put this in some closet to be mothballed. And one thing you can imagine is if you unrolled this tracker and put a layer at the top of this CMS cavern and one layer as far down in the basement, would you be able to resolve a blip on the bottom, which may, look like, which may just look like one particle, with then two blips on top uh, with some separation? And with some very optimistic order of magnitude estimates, this is about a factor of 10 too small. But that's not actually so bad. And what you about know, the event rate? I mean, is there any events at all? Yeah, so this, this, yeah, this, is, this is taking into account the, the event rate. It's saying that, that you have dark matter from like one TV, I think, collecting, giving you some flux of dark photons. So, I'm sorry, because there's two questions. There's the resolution, mm -hmm. right? You're saying the resolution is fine, but you just don't have enough of that. It's, yeah, your, your surface area is too small. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Sorry. sorry, yeah. Okay. Um, and I don't know. You can, if you want to be wish, if, if you want to be wishful, you can imagine there are other detectors you can you can take apart. Kind of kind of yeah. Atlas. Yeah. So, so Atlas actually has a different technology. So they, they, those you can't uncurl and, and, and do, unfortunately. Anyway, um, just to wrap things up, so, so again, here, here is the, the mad lib that summarizes our, our particular indirect detection angle. Directionality is the name of the game. Um, we have this inversion between the Earth and the Sun, but now the Earth is actually a much better place to look for dark photons, um, and, and largely because of this non-perturbative summer felt enhancement. Um, fun things to think about, what would it take to see double tracks? Um, these, the dark photons from the sun, you're really being hit by, by B fields, right? So if I said this out loud, you guys would laugh at me. I'll do it anyway. Um, you could look for dark photons coming from the sun using Ice Cube because we now we know that dark photons will sometimes decay into neutrinos. So you can use Ice Cube in this revolutionary way to look for neutrinos, which of course is what it was made for. Um, but th this is actually something which Ice Cube is looking for, for directional neutrinos from the sun. Um, and yeah, and there are fun things that you can play with. So thank you very much for your time. More questions? Hopefully. Nobody else has a question. I have a comment, mm -hmm. which is that uh, the best part of this talk is that you managed to sneak in Comic Sans font without anybody noticing. <laughs> I thought John would be standing up clapping. <laughs> okay. Um, if there are no more questions or comments, we okay. thank you again. Thank you. I think that, that wasn't the best part of the time. That was an excellent part. Thank you. Really nice. <laughs> Can I just ask some, sure. some wild ass questions? Yeah, yeah, so yeah. I haven't thought about, I've never thought about uh, this stuff. Um, so probably your questions are very naive. But, um, could I think about capturing dark matter in the solar system? In other